This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us over the Internet today, especially those of you who are serving our country abroad. Thank you for being with us again. This week, we're going to step away from global politics and economics, the environment, technology, and emerging social trends for just a moment to talk about a problem for which we have a 100% indisputable cure. In a few minutes, internationally acclaimed violin virtuoso and humanitarian Itzhak Perlman will be with us to talk about just how far we have come and how close we are to making medical history. We've succeeded in eliminating 99% of the incidences of polio around the world. But in many ways, this success may have produced a false and dangerous sense of comfort. Will we push forward and eradicate the threat of polio once and for all? Or will we leave the door cracked open just wide enough for the next epidemic? What a shame it'd be to come so close and not go that additional 1%. But before Mr. Perlman joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Itzhak Perlman was born in Tel Aviv, Israel. When he was just two and a half years old, he could already emulate the pitch-perfect opera he heard over the radio, and by the time he turned three, he was asking for his first violin. Shortly afterwards, Perlman was struck with polio, which paralyzed his legs. He was fitted with heavy braces and used crutches to walk, but rather than defeat him, this tragic affliction only served to deepen his commitment to and love of the violin. It was this devotion which landed Perlman in the acclaimed Shulamit Academy in Tel Aviv, where the young prodigy was first discovered. And in 1958, Perlman was chosen to represent Israel in Ed Sullivan's Caravan of the Stars, and that marked the beginning of his esteemed public career. Perlman moved with his mother to New York to study at the Juilliard School of Music, where his talent and his imagination were prized. Soon his unorthodox technique elevated him to a stature achieved by few musicians. He has been the recipient of more music awards than we have time to name today, uh, and been responsible for elevating music scores such as Schindler's List and Memoirs of a Geisha, catapulting them into haunting award-winning compositions. In addition to playing at the White House for the Queen of England and audiences all around the world, conducting world-class orchestras, taking time to teach young musicians, and recording best-selling classics, Mr. Perlman acts as an official ambassador for the This Close Battle to Permanently Eradicate Polio. And today we're going to learn why he joined this important mission. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program violin virtuoso, conductor, teacher, and humanitarian, Mr. Itzhak Perlman. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Perlman. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Just because people are familiar with the word polio, uh, I don't want to assume that everyone understands what polio is, because after all, we've eradicated 99% of the cases worldwide. So, News outlets don't have much reason to pay attention to the disease. So let me open today's program by asking you to explain what polio is and how children contract it. Well, polio is uh, is a virus that attacks young kids and uh, usually attacks uh, limbs, you know, like legs, sometimes arms, and so on. And uh, it can be contracted very easily. It's contagious just by, you know... Uh, uh, you know, going together with somebody that has it and so on. Uh, uh, I don't actually know when I contracted polio when I was like three and a half or four, um, I, how it happened. But I do know that I used to go to uh, kindergarten and uh, one day uh, I was uh, not able to walk. And so it was, it, but that was during the epidemic uh, in 1948 in Israel. Mm-hmm. And so, on. so, were there um, other children it, in your particular kindergarten that were afflicted? Probably, probably. I did not know that. You know, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, I was uh, I was too busy being sick. I was they, they uh, you know I was in the hospital for two or three weeks, and uh, and they did several things at that time that was before the vaccine. Yes, of course. 
And so they did things like uh, spinal taps to, to see what was happening and so on and so forth. And I didn't really remember much. All I remember and was, these, these were very uh, painful procedures. Well, I, you know, I was, I was really out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just remember very vaguely seeing a window in my hospital room with the sun, uh, sunshine in the morning and setting up at night for several days. And, uh, and then what happened was that then they took me home and uh, my new my new life started. And the new life was basically no no more uh, playing, uh, you know, on my uh, scooter, my little scooter that I used to have and uh, and running around. But the new life in, in, uh, consisted of uh, being fitted for uh, leg braces and, uh, you know, and, and crutches. And it started. But, you know, uh, you mentioned the fact that, uh, um, you know, despite of all of that, I was, uh, you know, I continued to stress to what, to what I wanted to do, which was music. A lot of it has to do, had to do with my parents, really. Because as a young kids, you know, uh, they can adjust to everything very, very easily. It's not like getting polio at the age of 20 or 25. Yes. Uh, because when you have a life that you are you're used to, you know, all you know, you you you're you're a teenager and you you go to school and so on, and all of a sudden it attacks you. That's very very difficult. But when I was a kid, you know, I was three three and a half four years old. Not much, uh, 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 not much of a regular life experience. I had just quite a couple of years. So this was. One of those things where I had to do something different. I had to switch gears, and that's what happened. And uh, and uh, and of course the music again. That has to had to do with uh, the, the fact that my legs were uh, affected by polio, not my arms. Uh, that it did not leave any reason not to continue with what I wanted to do, which was play the violin. That's what happened. And in you, as you point out, your parents played a big role in your optimism. They're absolutely the attitude. I mean, the attitude was it, it was not there was never a, a question of, oh, poor boy, you know, I mean, uh, what are we going to do about it? And so on and so forth. The, the question was to look for the future and to look, what are we going to do? Well, he is interested in music. My talent, or whatever talent, you know, whatever promise I showed before did not change. And so uh, what they did for me was we moved to a neighborhood where uh, school was about a block, a block away. So I could actually walk to school mm-hmm. uh, every day, which I did, you know. And then, but of course, uh, the thing that was unusual about me, so it was not so much the fact that I had to walk with crutches and braces and leg braces, but the fact that I had to practice three hours every day, and you know, the, my friends—that's what they they thought was weird about me. Not so much, not so much that the fact that I that I needed leg braces, but the fact that my God, you know, after school he actually sits down and starts to practice scales. My God, that's silly, crazy. <laughs> so, but that's, that's what it was. <laughs> Well, I, I think that it makes a big difference for any child that um, your your parents set the tone uh, for Absolutely. your for your optimism, for your hopefulness in life. And uh, certainly when you're met with an unearned challenge uh, such as polio, um, it's their attitude in helping you to assess the assets that you do have and not focusing on those that you that uh, might absolutely. limit you in any way. And certainly you right. had the benefit of those parents, which uh, played a huge role. Absolutely. And, and, you know, my life, my life as a child was otherwise normal. You know, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. I was not on the uh, on the. Uh, uh, track team. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that was when I got a little bit of time also I could practice. <laughs> Very so, good. Very good. Well, we know. have to take our first scheduled break. And when we come back, we're going to learn about our success in eradicating polio worldwide. You're listening to the Costa Report.
Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com, that's RebeccaCosta.com, and order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now, you'll be glad you did. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone? This data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM big data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Prices are for base buildings only and may not be available in some areas. This is an alert. If your business or church is building this year, you're about to pay more than you should. This could mean thousands of dollars more for your office, retail space, church, or warehouse. So call General Steel now for the quality and the price in a pre-engineered steel building that you just can't beat. That's right. General Steel can save you thousands of dollars with a pre-engineered steel building designed for your business or church. How much can you save? How about a 50 by 100 foot building for under $35,000? So don't pay thousands more than you should without calling General Steel first. Call 898-STEEL today and save as much as half the cost and time of conventional construction. Don't let rising steel prices put your project in jeopardy. Call now to lock in your price for three months. Call 898-STEEL. That's 898-STEEL. Don't spend thousands more than you should. Call 800-987-8335. Hi, I'm Pamela Fugit-Hetrick, the host of Money Moves. Cash flows and money moves, but do you find money moving out of your wallet faster than it comes in? Do you wish you had a personal money manager? Do your best Dirty Harry imitation. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Go ahead. Make my day. Pretend that your finger is your gun. Quick draw, aim, point, and straight ahead. Notice that one finger is pointing out, but you have at least three pointing back at you. You're the best person to manage your own money. To get the tools you need for the job, listen to Money Moves Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. As your host, I promise that each week, Money Moves will leave you with some tips and tools to help you manage your own money. Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Remember, that's Thursday nights, 7 p.m. for Money Moves. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is violin virtuoso, an advocate for the eradication of polio, Mr. Itzhak Perlman. And before the break, you were sharing your personal story and how polio did very little to stand in the way of your love and your pursuit of music. Uh, now, looking at the big picture for just a moment, in 1988, we were looking at a thousand cases of polio a day in 125 countries. And today, we're down to 400 cases a year. Is that right? Uh, something like that. Something like that. Maybe maybe even less. But what is, what is interesting about it and, and, and a little bit concerning is that even one case can restart the whole cycle. 
-hmm. And that's why it is so important to fight for total eradication of polio with zero cases. And all of that has to do with the kind of infrastructure when it comes to vaccination. And, you know, if you've got it all set up with vaccination, then we are home free. And so, but so that's why this this uh, this uh, particular disease is misleading when it comes to the numbers. My God, you know, so many people and right now look, they're almost nothing. Well, you know, these days with international flights and so on and so forth, one case can start the ball rolling, and here we are, here we go again. You know what's protecting? For example, here in the United States is we've got a, a real system or inoculations or vaccinations of polio, which is, you know, it's like there's no problem. You know, you go to the doctor, you've got your shots, polio included, and so on, and you're home free. And that's basically what the the whole the, the, uh, the whole the effect of, of this is. And the, the goal around the world, and there's still two or three countries that still have cases, is to start to be able to inoculate everybody to to vaccinate everybody, and it's so simple. Just take a, you know, a little lump of sugar or something like that, and that's it. It's not a big deal, but it's a big deal if you get it. This is clearly a disease where even if you stamp out ninety nine point nine 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 percent, it doesn't yeah. matter. You leave a crack in the door open. Exactly. Uh, exactly. For an outbreak, you, to... you either have to go for it, or it doesn't matter what the percentage is. Yeah, yeah. So you have to really be very vigilant and 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 try. And so, so when people say, "What can you do?" You know, Rotary International have been doing a fantastic job in eradicating polio, and then I've done a couple of uh, concerts for them and and spoke on their behalf on the campaign of we, which is we are all almost we are almost there, and so on. But, yes, Rotary uh, International has adopted this as as their primary mission is to completely right. eradicate it, get rid of that 1%. Now, yeah. earlier this year, the CDC declared that India is polio-free after three years of no reported cases. And yeah. India was once considered the epicenter for polio. Right. Uh, the CDC polio. also declared nine other countries in uh, the southeast region of the world as completely polio-free. So what did these countries do to become polio-free in such a short amount of time? I think that it, I think it has to be a systematic way of, uh, of uh, vaccination. Immunization. All, immunization, mm-hmm. right. That's, that's the only thing. That's, and it's, that's why it, the whole thing is so simple and so that there is no excuse if something like this doesn't happen. There's no excuse. Now, you know, here's a reason oh immunization. I- immunization is very important because uh, it, you can get polio even in countries that are not reporting cases and are not infected. Uh, as I understand it, you were living in Tel Aviv when you were afflicted. And though there hasn't been a case of polio in Israel for a very long time, it's important to note that experts continue to collect sewage samples in Israel, exactly. which are testing positive for the polio virus. Right. Uh, right. This is a strain, actually, that's been traced to Pakistan. So for a layman like myself, that feels like the virus is just lying in wait. And the minute we relax on immunizations and hygiene and education, we could just just as easily slip backwards again. Or, or am I being too paranoid here? No, no, you're being exactly right. You're, you're not being too paranoid at all. That's exactly I was about to say. You don't need me in this program. You are so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> no. you know, I mean, you're absolutely correct. You know, absolutely correct. I, I, because I'm thinking, well, you know, when we talk about eradicating a disease, and it, like, let's just take Israel, for example, no reported cases. So you think, okay, well, the disease is gone. Well, no, it it continues to show up in sewage samples. And so if Israel didn't have an aggressive immunization uh, program, uh, we would see outbreaks. Exactly. So it's it's all a question of the infrastructure of, you know, the system. If you have a good system of immunization, you're home free. That's all it is. Now, does the fact that polio has been narrowed down to a few countries mean it, really mean anything when, you know, outbreaks could spread in a matter of hours? As a matter of fact, I think in 2013, the largest number of reported cases occurred in previously polio-free areas. Well, it, it only means that we have to watch it all the time. And I think that uh, a show just uh, as, as yours, you know, really helps people to say, listen, this 
is not something that has nothing to do with me because it's very well good. As I said before, you know, the stuff travels very easily. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if somebody comes in from a country that may, that may, who may have something like that, you can get it very easily. So, and the thing that uh, saves the United States is because of this system, which is, you know, which is airtight. We have, we have the airtight system and that's why we are okay. But, you know, other countries that do not, that's the, the next goal is to make those countries also airtight. So that if you have something like a sample in a, a sewage sample and so on, you say, okay, you know, that's, it's, it's terrible, but we are, we are safe. We have protection. We are protected. And that's what this whole thing is about, to continue to have all countries be properly protected. And, there, and you know, there is, as I said before, you know, when you get polio, I know that polio usually uh, gets, uh, you know, people who are children, it's affected, but sometimes it's affect people who are older as well. Mm-hmm. So this is something very, very serious that we have to watch for. A- absolutely. Um, you know, I, I it, it's not just a personal quest on your part. You, you've been a great humanitarian all of your life. Um, uh, there is a part of you that is such a sharing and loving human being, not only generous with your music, but also generous with your time to uh, young musicians who are coming up. Uh, through the ranks and need to learn the business and and to hold on to their love of music despite their commercial successes. Um, and the fact that you joined this mission, uh, I have to believe that there has to be a little bit of frustration here because I don't, uh, as much as I, I uh, commend the 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week news channels, they don't seem to want to give this the appropriate coverage uh, in order to uh, advance the agenda, uh, just so we can get over this little hump. I mean, we're so close. As, as you point out, we're so close. We're down to 1%. We've identified the, the three or four major countries where immunization programs are needed. And if you can take a country that was ground zero like India, uh, where there were so many obstacles to eliminating polio, and have them be polio-free in the course of three years... We're talking 36 months, uh, then that should be the role model for every country that is reporting cases today. Now, we're going to take another short break, but stay tuned. We'll be right back with more from Itzhak Perlman. You're listening to the Costa Report. We're fortunate to have Scott Caraccioli with us to explain how the process of making sparkling wines influences a winemaker's approach to making a Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Yeah, it's really a driving factor in terms of style and really kind of making it a little bit more old world. Um, we use all French oak, which is the same thing that we use in our sparkling wines. So I would imagine that someone who's not making sparkling wines will take a totally different approach. Yeah, it's a matter of viewpoint when it comes down to when you have a French winemaker making bubbles, you end up with a leaner, more European style of wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, Cellars, where you have to spell it to drink it. This is Monterey College of Law Dean Mitchell Winnick inviting you to join my co-host, law professor Stephen Wagner and me for Wagner and Winnick on the Law. Each Saturday afternoon from 4 to 5 here on KSCO AM 1080, we will discuss the legal current events that impact our daily lives. Call in and join the discussion starting Saturday, July 12th at 4 p.m. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, 
it may change your life. Recently, something called avocado soybean unsaponifiables, a European research review determined that it was beneficial for patients with osteoarthritis of the hip, can help reduce the production of inflammatory agents secreted from the body's defensive immune system. Unsaponifiables are molecules that are found in all vegetation. A class of compounds called sterols is a type of unsap that can help stabilize blood fats and lower blood cholesterol. Unsaps may have anti-inflammatory benefits too. Other unsaponifiables get deposited in the skin and the eyes where they can help protect delicate tissues from UV rays. Most eye vitamins will contain at least one or two unsaps like lutein or zeaxanthine. Beta carotene is a particularly important skin health supporting unsaponifiable that the body can convert into vitamin A. The king of unsaponifiable botanicals is shea butter. While most plants will contain one to two or maybe three percent unsaponifiables, unrefined shea butter can contain up to 19 percent. Shea butter has been endowed by nature with powerful sun protection unsaponifiables that indigenous tribes have used for centuries. In the past few years, another African tree has become popular for its unsaponifiable rich fruit. It's called argan, and it's quickly becoming legendary in the world of hair care. Argan oil unsaponifiables were shown to provide protection against hair damage associated with coloring processes and dyes. Other unsaps from argan, including polyphenols and vitamin E, have been touted for their anti-hair loss benefits and for moisturizing and softening hair. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos too at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Are you a mom? Well, we have a Mr. Mom on KSCO. Mr. Mom here. On my show about parenting, you'll hear from best-selling authors, psychologists, dog trainers, bail bondsmen, experts you need to know. We laugh, think, and plot about how to scheme our way out of our next parental miscue. Don't miss the next Mr. Mom program on KSCO, Sundays at 1 p.m. That's Mr. Mom, Sundays at 1 p.m. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is Itzhak Perlman, who is explaining that when countries commit to an immunization program for polio, they are essentially protecting their citizens from a 100% preventable disease. We can't get rid of the, the uh, disease itself, but we can certainly arm people against it. And, uh, and we can certainly eradicate polio once and for all. Now, for listeners who might be wondering what the economic costs are, because uh, I always get questions about this, um, I read somewhere that it costs less than 60 cents a child to immunize against polio. And more importantly, organizations like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation offer two to one matching donations to the uh, to Rotary International, who has adopted this as their mission, as we spoke about earlier. And I know that you've produced concerts to raise awareness and donations. So uh, there se- certainly seems to be sufficient funding to immunize every child, or, or do I have that wrong? I think that probably is. I have a feeling that one of the problems is that some some people may feel that this is a dangerous thing. Maybe uh, you know, uh, maybe they're 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 not well aware that this kind of immunization really can prevent something like that from happening. So it, it's not only the funding, but also the kind of education and awareness that you have to give the people. Uh, you know who are, who live in a place where maybe they may not used to an immunization program and so on and so forth. But I think a lot of it has to also do with education and awareness. Mm-hmm. We we have some people in in this country who believe that uh, any immunization is bad for a child and m- might be connected to autism and other diseases. Um, yes. I, I hear all kinds of crazy science. I'm a scientist, so it drives me nuts when I'm at uh-huh. a dinner party and, and you know, I'm in front of a mother who says, well, I'm not immunizing my child against anything. And I, I you know, I have to fill my mouth with food so I don't start screaming yeah. at the top of my lungs. Yeah, it's, fr- it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. But, you know, unfortunately, if something happens to somebody like that, that they, 
they would probably think about it differently. But, uh, you know, some people have a certain uh, attitude. They said, I'm not doing this for my child. And then, you know, if you have certain countries where you don't have the education, then, uh, you know, uh, you you can have somebody, even with all the money in the world, you know, and the availability of the vaccine, it's not going to help if people don't want to do it. So that's that's another fight that you have to go for, you know, the fight of, 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 of uh, awareness, uh, social awareness. But doesn't this have to come from the government down? Isn't this one of those things that the, the government has to take the lead on? Probably, yeah. probably. But it's all a question of how famous is this disease? You know, it seems to me and you, you and me that, that you know, when you think about polio, you know, I mean, this, you don't need to talk about it. We know about polio, but maybe certain governments are haven't heard about it or maybe don't take it very seriously. And I think that's basically it. You know, how seriously do you take it and how seriously do you say this is a problem that we have to solve right now or something may happen? Uh, unfortunately, unless it really happens, people don't believe in it. You know. Well, here's people the problem. The, the closer you get to eradicating it, the less interested the press is in it. Exactly. Uh, it, exactly. It's got an inverse algorithm. You get rid of a disease 99% and nobody wants to cover it because it, it looks like it's already taken care of. What we forget is it can come back in, in a second. Yes, it's misleading. It's totally the 1% is misleading. So, v- v- you know, very I mean, much so. Do we do it. we have enough funding to immunize all children throughout the world? In your view, I don't think. Well, I I don't really know, but I'm I'm sure that we do. Well, if I mean, Bill and Melinda I'm Gates sure are matching know. donations two to one, I have to believe we're we're we, we and it's sixty cents a child. Uh, if we do the math, there it looks like there's plenty of uh, funding. Yeah, I think it's the I think it's the awareness and. Uh, mm-hmm. In the system, we have to set up the system better, and that I don't know if money can money can buy that. I hope I think money. My, I, it seems to me that money can buy almost anything, and uh, I know health it cannot buy, but certainly in this particular case, it can buy protection against a terrible, terrible disease. Now, in terms of the cost to arrest or uh, treat a deadly outbreak, the CDC estimates that an outbreak would put. 200,000 children at risk every single year. So this is a clear case, in my view, of spending very little to preempt an outbreak now or the regret that comes from allowing something we could have cured uh, continue to go on and bearing a much larger economic cost uh, down the road. Absolutely. It's, it's really it's, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. You know, you've got to so do what's it. holding these other countries up, in your view? Is it cultural? Are they afraid of immunization? Could be. It could be culture. It could be a lack of awareness. It could be a lack of the intensity of the problem. You know, the the you know, like uh, my God, we've got to do it right now. Maybe there's a lack of this kind of awareness. It's got to be there. Are no, there's you know, because this this whole thing is so simple, simple to do. And as you said, you know, not not very expensive and so on. So it's it's a lack of the feel that this is something that's got to be done or else. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, if you have an outbreak uh, when it's too late, then maybe there will be more awareness and more feel that we've got to do this. And, and, and let's hope that we it doesn't need, you know, we don't need that kind of an outbreak to, to let governments know that this is really something that we should do right now to make sure that there is nothing that there are no, there are no outbreaks of of, uh, of this of this disease yeah you know? we, we were set we're such an alarmist society we're so reactive yeah. when we have the opportunity to preempt yeah. uh, and and this is you know I'm an evolutionary biologist I will tell you that one of the greatest assets that humans have developed over millions of years right of evolution is the ability to look ahead and then to fashion a, a an action in the present to avoid uh, a danger and a threat. Uh, we're, we're the only animal that's capable of doing that. There are no other creatures capable of doing it. And yet, when faced with something like this, where we're down to the last 1%, uh, as as you have pointed out uh, on your website, as a matter of fact, we, er- we successfully eradicated smallpox. 
we were able to do that. Now we're down to the last one percent, and everyone's acting as though it could never, uh, it could never come back with a vengeance. And it, it's it's an incorrect thought, and the media isn't covering it, and we don't seem to be able to push ourselves over that finish line and and make medical history again. Well, listen. I mean, let's hope that uh, we have we have to continue to talk about it. The more we talk about it, the better it is. I think, you know. I mean, even if you if you get three or four people who can say, "Listen, I got to do something about this," it's worth it. And um, so, I mean, I'm 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 an eternal optimist. You know, I'm just hoping because there is so little to to finish. You know, we have so little to go before the whole thing is is eradicated. I, I would like I would like to be optimistic in this in this. Well. Case. Well, based on the model that we have for the success in India, I have to say that polio can be eliminated as a as a danger in a matter of months and years. Absolutely. Just a matter Absolutely. of a couple of years, we could completely extinguish this disease, and then we will not have to ever talk about it again. Absolutely. <laughs> and that, that should be our goal. <laughs> Absolutely, and I and I, I commend you uh, for joining Bill and Melinda Gates and Rotary International and uh, joining them in this crusade. Well, we have very little to go to push over that uh, that um, finish line, and uh, and I it, it's my honor to do a program today dedicated to this disease because uh, I speak at a lot of Rotary functions, and one of the things that the Rotary offers its speakers is. Every time you speak at, and they have thousands and thousands of chapters throughout the United States, but every time you speak at a Rotary function, the Rotary makes a donation to curing polio on behalf of the speaker. And, uh, and so that's one, another way that they collect donations and, uh, and they contribute. And we have to take our last scheduled break, but stay right where you are. We'll be right back after these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev, former leader of the Soviet Union and master architect of modern-day Russia. Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism. Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin. And Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouth-watering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berry licious dish. Howdy, folks. This is Randy the Realtor letting you know the 2014 County Fair slogan is Sow it, grow it, show it. But don't forget to bring it to the county fair so you can win a ribbon. If you need to buy or sell a home, call me, Randy the Realtor, and I'll make it an award-winning experience. Give me a call at 831-566-2590. That's 831-566-2590. 
or visit my website at aptoshomefinder.com. So what about organic food? It's way more expensive than the regular non-organic variety, but is it really better for you? So it would seem. After all, most of us who think about it would probably choose food grown without pesticides, hormones, fertilizers, and other chemicals. We are very excited about our guest on the upcoming KSEO special. 20 years ago, Jordan Rubin was a 19-year-old with severe, horrendous medical problems too numerous to mention in this promo. He was expected to die, but didn't. Instead, he decided to completely overhaul his diet, taking guidance from the Bible, and cured himself of all the diseases and conditions, and went on to become a very successful organic food entrepreneur and best-selling author of The Maker's Diet and many other popular books on food and nutrition. Jordan Rubin and Beyond Organic is a story you will want to here on the next KSCO special this Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, right here on AM 1080 KSCO. Tune in to the Dave Allen Show every Sunday at 4 for an eclectic mix of guests, music, and hot talk that spins towards the positive. So if you're tired of confrontational bickering on the radio, take a step to the positive. Take a step with the Dave Allen Show every Sunday from 4 to 6 p.m. on KSEO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and today our guest is Itzhak Berlman. Now, Mr. Perlman, I can't let you go without taking this opportunity to thank you for many years of classical music that have meant so much to me and and also our listeners. And and among the scores you have immortalized is the theme to Schindler's List, which uh, you worked on with composer John Williams. That has to be one of the most moving pieces of all time. So when you receive a score like this, uh, how much of your own experience went into your treatment of, of that? Well, when I uh, when John Williams called me up and he said to me, "Listen, I'm writing this uh, script for this film called Schindler's List," I had actually, to be honest with you, not heard that story. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he told me about that story, and of course, uh, you know, my uh, all my uh, a lot of my relatives, you know, my my grandmother, grandfather, and son, they were all. Uh, they were all uh, uh, victims of the Holocaust. So, you know, I only had my immediate parents who came to Israel before before this whole thing happened. And so um, I uh, immediately knew what the whole thing was about. But it's, it wasn't just that was uh, the story that was affected, uh, that affected the way I, I, I heard the score, but it was the score itself. You know, and and John Williams did such an amazing uh, job on on the, giving the flavor of that music. That right now, I must tell you that when I go all over the world, it doesn't matter whether it's the United States or Asia or or South America. The only thing that people really want me, the only request that they give me is to play the same from Schindler's List, which. Which means that this whole thing, it only goes to prove you how international music is and how this, uh, this thing is so, is so moving. It's such a great piece, and I'm just very, very lucky that I'm associated with it. Well, it, 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 somehow you were able to take what John had written and personalize it. There is so much emotion in your music. And uh, actually, in preparation for our interview today, I, I watched uh, an early YouTube video uh, of you playing Schindler's List, and I was just brought to tears all over again. I I I, I don't know if I'm just uh, you know emotional, <laughs> but oh, yeah. but I it, 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 it's very are. hard. It was it was very hard to just listen to it without it, it not and even if it hadn't been associated with the movie, th- this is what I think you did was that the the music is um, although it's wonderful and it was a privilege to be associated with that movie that film. Uh, even if it hadn't been, uh, in and of itself, it was such a beautiful composition, and you had um, played it so uh, beautiful. John Williams is known as a musician's composer, and um, 
I think I I first understood what that meant when I I happened to be a guest in his home in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I had a second home up up the road from his. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was at his home, I I happened to see just a regular book, uh, a piece of literature that was cracked open. And in the margins of the book were scrawled tiny notes right next to the words. And, And I... It was the first time that I understood that a a true musician or composer hears music in everything, e- even in the written word. Uh, w- what was your experience working with John like? Well, he, first of all, John is this. There cannot be a nicer person than mm-hmm. John. John is a sweetie pie. He's such a wonderful guy. But thing is that he's probably one of the last composers that actually writes his music with pencil. Yes, you know, because a lot of composers, you know, they're all right now with computers and so on. There are so many fantastic programs, but John is an old-fashioned composer. He writes everything out and so on. What 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 amazes me, you know, about him is that how he is a, like a chameleon that he's able to take a theme uh, uh, of of you know a, a subject and make it into something so amazing. You know, we talk about geisha, so that sounded so. So Asian and so on. You talk about Schindler's List; it sounded so um, um, so European, so Eastern European, and so on and so forth. So you know, whatever he takes, he's able to to do it. You know, when I did this uh, um, uh, inauguration for Obama, you know, I mean, he wrote this amazing piece that was so quote American. And yes. So, on. so he's able to do it. He's just a fantastic, uh, fantastic artist. He seems to know the culture and grab the uh, the spirit of that culture. And uh, the word I always use is, is that it, it, it's very authentic. And I think the two of you together, uh, where he's coming from a very authentic place, and, and uh, needless to say, your music is, is, uh, certainly has that characteristic, and, and, uh, and people are, are always using the word authentic. Um, I uh, I think the two of you collaborating was just uh, it, it, it always produces such an amazing result, and uh, and I would imagine there's a good friendship there. Very good friendship, and uh, and it's just uh, that whenever we talk, you know, we basically talk the same language. You know, when it comes to music, it's the same language. And when you hear John music, whether it's a uh, E.T. or Schindler's List, it's always you know it's always memorable. And that's you know that's a that's the deal of of, of a that fine composer that when you leave the movie theater you can actually remember what you heard as the music because the music is for me it's such an important part of any film is what happens in the background which is really and and one of the things about uh, Schindler's List that's so amazing to me is not only where the music was but where the music was not you know because yes. if you see you know there were so many silences there that were so as meaningful as the music itself. Yes, so where, all, where you wind up pulling back. Uh, but John yeah. does that too in his music. He seems to know yeah. the moment to pull back and to yeah. show restraint. Uh, and it's something that you do with your violin as well. Uh, there are moments where you really lean into it, but, but there are moments that are very delicate where you seem to show tremendous restraint. Uh, and I think that in, in so many ways, that's just wisdom and experience speaking. I suppose. I don't know. I mean, I always call it the sensor. You know, want to know how much it's too much and how much it's too little and just do it right. Yes. You know, that's, it's like, you know, that's I, experience, that's though. <laughs> that's something that takes a lifetime to learn. Now, unfortunately, we are out of, all out of time today. But I, I do want to thank you for uh, taking time to be with us and for working tirelessly on behalf of children and parents everywhere in the world. Thank you so much, Mr. Perlman. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about today's interview with Itzhak Perlman, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or pretty much all over the Internet. And if you missed the full interview with Mr. Perlman or any of our other guests, uh, remember you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our new YouTube channel. And while you're at our website, take a moment to check out our new videos, our book reviews and photographs, and be sure to pick up your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. 
All you have to do is click on any image of the book on any of the pages, and it'll take you right over to where you can order it. And you can uh, order a custom dedication and autograph, so the book makes for a very special gift for any occasion. Some of my most treasured possessions are books, which were signed by the author and dedicated to me. A book is really a great gift anytime, but imagine the surprise of the recipient when they open the book and see a custom inscription inside. So go to RebeccaCosta.com and order a copy. Do it right now. It only takes two minutes. A hundred percent of the proceeds go toward keeping interviews like the one you heard today with Itzhak Perlman on the air. So not only do you get a page turner that's hard to put down, you also get a custom inscription and you also support agenda free journalism the way journalism used to be and i long for a day when we get back to that and we don't have multinational corporations uh, driving the agenda of news outlets um that that would be a nice thing i think and i, I think we can all get on board uh, my guest next week is former chairman of the defense policy board richard pearl We'll be here to discuss greater instability in post-war Iraq and Syria and the Ukraine, as well as the recent eruption between Israel and Hamas. I came into the studio today, and uh, one of the uh, news reporters here said, is this the beginning of World War III? And I said, I don't even want to think about that. Uh, But we seem to have disturbances uh, occurring all over. And uh, at the same time, and I know that many of us are uh, concerned about that. I know I am. Uh, Don't miss the always outspoken Richard Pearl next week on the only news program which puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Mm -hmm. 